Okay. Thank you for gathering this weekend on the subject of archetypes. I always think when I start to teach, I am always very mindful. First of all, I always begin with a private prayer in my heart. And um, for me, that is always hover over us, God. And that is from my time with Teresa of Avila, who always taught her nuns to pray in that way, hover over me, God. That's become a prayer for me that is a constant. And I think of that, I must say that prayer 20 times a day. And it is one that is the most calming for me. I think of grace pouring into you. I think of light, true grace pouring into you. And at some point we're gonna talk about the archetype of grace, what is grace? because you can't leave here without dwelling on that power and knowing it in your heart, especially since this was once upon a time a Catholic church that we're standing in. And so there for Paolo. So um, there has to be some element of grace that you leave here with. And what is the grace of healing? And what is grace? Because that in its own way is more than an archetype, an impulse in your soul. So I think we'll close with a healing prayer at the end of the workshop. Is that okay with you? Okay. So hover over us. So now we're gonna go into the world of archetypes. And the first, I want to begin with a general definition of what is an archetype so we're all sort of on the same page. And then we're going to go into uh, why it's important, I think, to even go into this subject at all at this time in our lives. Why you would even be interested in learning this language and learning anything about your own archetypes learning how to perceive the world and your own life through a lens called an archetype. And in order for me to set that stage, I'm going to give a historic perspective about where are we today and what's changing in our world and why being able to see something through an archetypal lens is so valuable. In fact, I would call it the most valuable tool you could ever have within you. There are tools you can have in your hands, and then there are tools that you must have within you as a visionary. And the capacity to see or perceive is perhaps the most valuable tool you will ever have to be able to perceive like a laser is the most valuable tool you'll ever have. Perception, to be able to perceive truth. What is really going on? What is that person really saying to me? How do I actually make a decision at this crossroads? What is this moment really about? When you ask a question that profound, what you are actually seeking is truth, but what are the tools of truth? It's one thing to say, you know, it's one thing to, to say, I gotta figure out what's going on here. But you, it is you who has to train yourself to have tools of truth within you. Truth is not simply going to come up and say, well, I'll, I'll just talk to you about this. It is you who has to become a refined instrument so that if, if it, it, you know, the, in, the, in the scripture, Jesus says at one point, you cannot cast a pearl before a swine. That's actually one of the most profound little teachings. And you yourself have to become this pearl so that you are able to actually perceive truth. And here's the reason. Truth 
changes your relationship to time and space, to the speed at which your life changes. I'll give you a very simple example that's really not so simple. I'll give you two. The first, the very first, is that, and this is archetypal, meaning it's happened to everybody. And an archetype, I'll start there, an archetype is a pattern of power that we were all, that we are born understanding because it's inherent to the human experience. It is our fundamental language. An archetype is the power we all recognize that is in our nature. One of the things that is true about us is that we are compulsive about categorizing everything in order to protect ourselves. The moment you see somebody, you categorize them, and that's an archetype. You label them. That is an archetype. You instantly categorize. That person is fill in the blank. Fill in the blank. And they do that to you. You always think you're the only one doing that. <laughs> But they do that to you. What do you think they see? What label do you think they give you? What do you think you're projecting when they see you? What label are they giving you that is so obvious to them that it's written all over your energy, that is so obvious to them? It's so obvious to me. Your labels are oozing from you. You are an open book to everybody. All your archetypes are practically an open book. And you think it's just you because you think the world spins around you. You have no idea that people are labeling you the moment you walk out of the room. That at least 30 people have given you an archetype already this evening in this room. They have assessed the kind of power that you are radiating, and that is an archetype. And they do that, and you do that, because it is a defense, a survival mechanism. Does that person, will that person threaten my survival? This is why we do this. It is instinctive in us. We, we look at somebody and we instantly think that person is. Is that person a warrior? Is that person a rapist? Is that person a con artist? Is that person, and what do we say when someone turns out to be a con artist? How did I not know that? What was I thinking? Is that person, that person looks like an addict. That woman looks like a natural born mother. Did you see her? I mean, she oozes mother. That person's a geek. This is a new archetype on the scene. We didn't have geeks pre-1970. We have hackers now. And if I said to you, how many hackers are ballroom dancers? You would think, we don't associate that. We think of hackers in a whole different character, and you all have the same association. That's an archetype, a pattern of power. We didn't have a meeting and say, okay, we're all gonna create the hacker archetype. What kind of characteristics are we gonna give them? It's not like that. We simply organically, power finds its own level. Characteristics in, in, in archetypes evolve. Nobody said, let's form the addict archetype. But Bill Wilson identified it so perfectly. And from that came AA. And he never used the word archetype. But he so perfectly did that, so perfectly did that. And what he also perfectly did, perfectly, perfectly, 
is that he separated the archetype and he said, this addict is the way the addict behaves. And then here's you. And this addict, when it gets hold of you, does this in everybody who has this addict. Which is why so many people I know who have children who are addicts, my kid really isn't like that. That's the addict in him. That's the addict in her. They don't use the word archetype, but that's exactly what they're talking about. So what an, an archetype is, is a pattern of power. And now the next level of it is that each archetype has comes complete with myths and stories. Archetypes are not like angels. They're not like, they're not alive. You know, I need a board to draw on. Hello, hello. I need a board to draw on or I'm li liable to start drawing on a, the wall and I do and I will do that. Yes. Okay. Um, archetypes are not like, they're not members of the sacred kingdom. They are not holy entities like saints or uh, angels. They are not divine beings that you can interact with or pray with or go into meditation with. This is not what an archetype is. They're mechanical, but they are conscious. You know, when I was writing sacred contracts, um, I, I, I was, uh, and I wrote in, bless your soul, I wrote about, um, it occurred to me how I got involved with archetypes, and by the way, I didn't forget where I'm going to take you after this, but you have to have a kind of a sponge brain with me. I um, first encountered archetypes as a result of my work with Norm Sheely when I, when I did medically, medical intuition very constantly for years and years and years. And in doing readings, medical readings, I started out very interested in trying to figure out where illness came from. And then I eventually put together the chart that became Creation of Health, which was a book I wrote way back with Norm in the 1980s identifying stress patterns that go along with about 75 or 80 illnesses. But eventually that led me to wonder, why aren't people healing? Why don't people want to heal? Because when I entered this field of the healing arts, I noticed that so many people had this interest in healing and at the time the enthusiasm in the field was that a positive attitude could beat anything and it was going to beat cancer and it was going to beat this and it was going to beat that and yet the the profiles i was encountering in people was uh, were quite the opposite, was much more along the lines of that healing scared people, that it was in fact the last thing they wanted. They wanted to be out of pain, but they didn't want to be healthy. Very fascinating, okay? So that's when I wrote Why People Don't Heal. Now I continue to do readings at this point and now I was looking at the human psyche with far more interest because I realized we were far more complex than I thought. That in us was this saboteurial force where we said one thing, but in fact we did the opposite. But were we aware that we were doing the opposite? Were we aware that we were in fact 
very complex to this nature, to our own nature. And then one day, and how I worked with Norm is that at the time I was living in New Hampshire in a little town called Walpole. And Norm, and he still lives in Springfield, right outside Springfield, Missouri. And he would call me and he would say, Carolyn, I have so-and-so in, in my office, his clinic. And always with the patient's permission, I would get the patient's name and age. I'm not an astrologer, so I don't do birth dates or anything like that. I don't need that. And what, what information, how information comes to me is that it's exactly like this. If I said to you, I want you all, I want you to image your living room. Now all of you have an image of your living room. Imagine, and what, what does that image look like to you? It doesn't look like anything. An image doesn't look like anything. An image is simply an image. It doesn't have sound to it. It doesn't have solidness to it. An image is a factor of imagination, okay? It's not physical. Imagery is not physical, it's energy. It's an energetic element. Now imagine that that image transitions instantly into my imagery, my image archive. The difference is, and I can pick up those images, the difference is that I have no feeling about anything in your living room. You have feeling about it because it's your living room, but I don't. It means nothing to me. I have no sentiment whatsoever. This is what makes me such a superb medical intuitive. I can pick up that imagery. It means nothing to me. I see the data. I interpret it. I'm, just, I'm a scientist this way. When I taught medical intuition, and I um, saw people getting very emotional. My hands are getting hot, da 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 da. They were getting into what Teresa of Avila would call the emotional zone. She didn't use the word zone, but she meant that. And she would have said to them, go in the kitchen and peel potatoes. You are not ready for this work. <laughs> because you're, you're making something up. You're making something up. You're getting emotional where there is no emotion. And the same is true as we get into your archetypes. There is no emotion in this level of consciousness. There is only data. You may then get emotional about the data you receive, but there is no emotion. It is absolutely and the world, the realm of energy has no emotion. You're past that dimension. It's simply data. And that's why I'm so good at that. I was born wired and I understood that from the get-go. I have no emotion there, zero. So I'm a savant at this because it simply makes sense. Eventually, I did one reading, and I received an impression that Norm was reading a child. But he had given me the name of an adult. And I said, all I'm receiving is a child, that this, this person is a wounded child. And that's all I can pick up. It was the first time I saw an archetypal image. Now, he said, well, what, 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 interpret that. Interpret that. Now, this whole line of, of teaching began with me telling you that archetypes have mythologies to them. They have stories. Each one contains stories. This, a wounded child archetype, it's an archetype. So I want you to think of it in this way. WC. Water closet in Britain. <laughs> but wounded child for us. Now, the wounded child archetype 
in general is an archetype that contains wounds, wounds that were acquired during childhood. This is true for every single person who has this archetype, which means everyone who has this archetype, who has this pattern, is here are all these people. See all these people? They're all attached to that big archetypal pattern in the sky. That's why they find each other. There's a magnetic. So everybody who has, this is why at workshops I'm so, I, I observe how people with the same wounds suddenly find each other within five minutes. <laughs> within five minutes, they simply sense each other, but it's magnetics. The type of wounds usually have been engaged pre-seven years old. The types of wounds are abusive, usually, you know, they're physically, mentally, sexually abusive. And they have damaged, they have done permanent damage. So wounded children have a permanent scar, permanent damage, that is haunting to them. Now the types of haunting then plays out in that wounded children have a pattern of anger that remains with them that erupts when they're older. And it's a continual eruption that plays out periodically in their other adult relationships. This is classic to this archetype, and it's destructive in their lives because somehow this particular archetype, this one archetype, erupts because the wounded child acts out the wounds and feels justified doing that. And that's the child part. It's a tantrum. And they hold every adult accountable or responsible for the wounds they had as children. Now, this is what an archetype is. It is a pattern of power that is universal. Everyone who has it has the same, some version of the same myth. And all of you have archetypal patterns that are unique to you. You don't have one. You have a number of archetypes. So if you said, tell me my archetype, I have a radio show with Hay House. Many of you may know that, or some of you. And oftentimes someone will say, tell me my archetype. And again and again, I'll have to say to them, oh, here we go. If you could see me in my office, I'm like, oh, Jesus, this again. But it's not, it's not one archetype. You have, you have, you know, like when I did sacred contracts, I put together a scheme of 12 because that's much more in keeping with the complexity of who we are and it goes with the natural balance, the natural balance of the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 hours of the day, the 12 hours of the night, the 12. It goes along with the 12. It is simply the way we are constructed. We are a pattern of 12. That is who we are and that's how we are. So when you, when you think about, and, and if you, you, know, you, you know yourself, you know that you are far more than one pattern of power. Now, when I was writing Sacred Contracts, I was working, you know, identifying numerous archetypal patterns and I was writing about them and things began to go haywire in my house. I mean, seriously haywire, I'm not talking small time. It was so 
horrendous that, first of all, every time I sat down to write the book, my, my mind would get jammed. And I, I, I would lose my capacity to focus. And it felt like something was going, you know. And so I thought, I, I can't write in my office anymore. So I duplicated the office. When I had moved back from New Hampshire, I moved in with my mom and my late aunt because uh, I wasn't sure where I was going to live. I didn't know if I was going to move to England, stay here in, in the United States. I didn't know what. And eventually I decided to buy a townhouse. It wasn't yet built. So I lived with them while it was being built. It was just grand. I lived with these two women who were great chefs. And I just, and that's where I wrote Anatomy of the Spirit. It was one of the most, two of the best years of my life. I mean, I sat in, in the lower, in the um, patio level of the house, uh, the house I grew up in, as a matter of fact, and it had this uh, lower uh, level room, and the door opened up to the patio, and I built a, fault, a, a wall, put up a wall temporarily, and the girls were upstairs by the kitchen. It was one of those tri-level homes. And I would open the door and say, you know what I want for dinner? <laughs> and honest to God, I would say things like, duck a la orange, and I would, shut the door <laughs> and I would hear these feet scampering and then I would hear the car start <laughs> and I would go up and there would be deck all orange for dinner they had nothing else to do <laughs> they were two chefs and one person to feed I'm telling you that's how it got so heavy they got they just you know and and it was marvelous because it was before my life got crazy it was before anatomy which turned, you know, made my life go crazy. It was just glorious. And once I started writing contracts, something, it was a presence in my house that felt like I was walking through a psychic fog. And because I'm so attuned to that world, I couldn't quite identify what it was, but it was what it was. My computers would blow out. The battery in my car had to be replaced five times. Um, so I duplicated my office back at my mother's. I thought, I'm going to write it back where I wrote anatomy. That didn't help at all. I enlisted the aid of Peter Occhio Grosso. He is a wonderful um, editor. He's also written some wonderful books. I needed someone to help ground me. I would talk the ideas out, and he would get them on paper. So I tried to talk it through so we could organize the book. My computer, then what I did was I bought a second house, way up in Sister Bay, Wisconsin. I thought, I've got to get out of here. I have got to get out of here. This is how bad it got. I mean, I'm not talking small time. I'm talking this house. I got a shaman to clean the house up. I got a priest. I got, I, I if I could have gotten the Pope, I don't, it was bad. I mean, it was, I never felt frightened. I felt like, like this. And so I, I got this, I got a um, home, I bought a house in Sister Bay, Wisconsin. I duplicated my, my uh, computer, a desk, got all that stuff. And I am not, a com I'm not computer savvy. So I had an assistant by the name of Jean who was a geek. And I said, get everything that I've got here, the same IBM computer, I need this, I need that, now go set it up up there. So she drives the 250 miles up to Sister Bay. She sets it up up there. And I go up there with my, my late dear Donald. And we, and I have to write now chapter two. I have, these, these were the days where you had those disks that you had to put into the computer, I mean, right? And they were still plastic wrapped and I opened it up and I'm really proud of myself at this point because I, I learned how to drag it and back it up on the disc. I hadn't started chapter two yet. We were up there 10 days. I write chapter two. I'm thinking, okay, okay, this is going all right. I'm getting this. 
I back up the whole thing on chapter two. Now remember, this was a disc that was wrapped, I opened it up fresh. There was nothing else on this computer. I had never used it before. The only thing on this computer is chapter two now. I have ba I backed it up. I backed it up. <laughs> and I know I backed it up because I opened it up and there it was. I went back home, popped it in, and the only thing on there was chapter one, no chapter two, and chapter one had duplicated itself to be 700 pages long. Just duplicated, duplicated, duplicated. At this point, I thought I was gonna go out of my mind. I really did. And this is when Peter O. came in, and he would spend days with me trying to construct sacred contracts. At the end of this book, at the end of this book, you know, books go in stages. You finish a book, then you get the, the um, uh, galleys to go through, then you get the, 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 and then you get the page proofs. I mean, you get all this stuff that you gotta go through, page proofs, galleys, and you know, all that. And I um, shipped everything back to New York. Everything was done, I was with, it was, and I, walked in and my agent, Ned, my uh, previous agent, Ned, called. I had just come in from a workshop. I still had my coat on. The phone rings. I pick it up. It was Ned. He said, did you ship the gals? Yes. And I said, Ned, is this book done now? Is it all done? Am I done with everything? And he said, yes. I, I didn't even take my coat off. I took every file, every single thing, every single thing that had anything to do with sacred contracts, and I threw it out. I took every page, every note, everything, and I hauled it to the trash and I threw it out. And a friend of mine said, are you out of your mind? This is archive stuff, this is your work. I said, oh, shut up, bye-bye. Out, <laughs> everything, out. And I felt like when I went into my house for the first time in a couple of years that the house had been cleared out and it was at that point I knew how, how real archetypes are. These are real forces. These are forces that we're dealing, that you are dealing with. These are psychic fields that are, you know, when you meet somebody, like I, I sometimes look at these people that are um, imitators. You know, like they obsess over something. They obsess over someone like Elvis Presley or, or you know, they, they, they become this person and they can't let go of that identity. And it does become a possession. And you look at someone like Marilyn Monroe, of course. And Marilyn Monroe had the goddess archetype. She, she embodied it, she embodied it. And that's one of the things that destroyed her, was because she wanted to play other roles in Hollywood. She wanted to do serious acting. But they would not let her out of, and this is interesting, sacred contracts. They wouldn't let her out of her contract as a goddess to expand to other archetypal expressions. And she was alcoholic and she took drugs. She couldn't get out of her other, that one archetype. And so it consumed her. It consumed her. So why do you, why? Do you need to know your archetypes? Because they will consume, because you, the, this idea that people, one of the phenomenons that defines our time is that we can't stop obsessing about ourselves. <laughs> There's never, ever, ever been another generation or other generations that are as obsessed about themselves as narcissistic as we are, as obsessed about every single part of ourselves, our, back, our past lives, even one life isn't good enough. <laughs> we have to go into a past life, a future life, this life, that life. We are absolutely obsessed. And when you say to someone, I'm seeking, what are you seeking? You don't even know. You can't even identify. How can you be on a path seeking and then when some 
a teacher asks you, what are you looking for? Then answer that with, I don't know. How can you possibly answer that way? Then what are you doing on this path? If that's the kind of answer you have. If I were, Teresa of Avila would say to you, then get off this path until you can actually name what you are looking for. Because if you are uncomfortable naming what you're looking for, then you are too immature to be on the path. Then you have no right to be on the path. What are you doing if you're walking a path blindly like that? If you are afraid to name it, because then you might just find it. And then what? And that too is archetypal. I might just find it. What's the it? What are you seeking? But this too is archetypal, that the human being on the path is scared of the path they're walking. And what you are so terrified of is actually that transition point from um, becoming someone who says, I don't know, to someone who says, I know. From walking in your own ignorance to suddenly realizing I'm walking in knowledge. To walking the irresponsible life, to walking a life where you see clearly. Are you following me here? Okay, so what you're really terrified of is living a truthful life. And now I'm going to take you back to the, the second archetypal moment that I referred to 20 minutes ago. This too is an archetypal experience that you have all had. Because archetypes are not just like the wounded child or the mother or the victim or the hermit or all the many archetypes that I can name. The rescuer, the princess, the artist, the healer, the many archetypes that exist in the arcana. There are also archetypal experiences, death and rebirth, the phoenix rising from the ashes, the Sisyphus syndrome, feeling like I'm always pushing and I almost, almost, almost get it over the top and then it just comes back and I have to start all over again. I feel like Sisyphus. I feel like I'm always carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. These are archetypal experiences. You describe this and someone says, I know just what you're feeling. Why do you know just what I'm feeling? Because it's an experience that is common to everybody. Common to everybody. This too, we have a word for it, it's called initiation. There are different types of experiences. One is called being initiated. And an, an, an initiation is an experience that has very specific characteristics to it. And all of you experienced this one. It happened roughly around the time you were seven years old. Here again, every single society names age seven as the great turning point for children. Why? Why age seven? Because it is age seven. Something happens at age seven. What is it that happens at age seven? Something very profound happens at age seven. What is it that happens at age seven? I'm going to give you the example. Somewhere in age, your age seven, a test was given to you. And that test was you did something wrong. But for the first time, when you were three and four and five, it didn't matter because you were not conscious. You were not conscious. 
around five and six, you're beginning to get conscious that this is a no-no and this is okay. Somewhere around six, you're really beginning to discern. You're really beginning to get. Is this the truth? Are you telling mommy the truth? Did you do this? Yes or no? Is this the truth? You're beginning to discern that you better tell the truth. And that it's not an okay thing to lie. That there's something about your conscience and truth that's a big deal. At age seven, the initiation is that for the first time, you, of your own free will, will do something that was either a lie or you took something that was not yours. You did something. And you got caught. You had to have gotten caught. You had to have gotten put on the spot. The third part about this is that the adult that, you, that confronted you, asked you, did you do this? The fourth part that is inherent to this experience is that you heard a voice that told you, tell the truth. But the voice came from the inside, tell the truth, and you heard that voice. You heard it, and you know you heard it. You absolutely heard it, absolutely you did. And you remember hearing it. Now, depending on how you answered is the most determining thing for the rest of your life. Why? Because if you lied in that moment and you said, no, no, I didn't do it, then regardless of what the outcome was, what is branded into you is that truth equals shame and punishment. And that lying is freedom and safety. And it's at that moment that truth becomes the thing you fear the most. Telling the truth gets you in trouble. Truth is terror. And that's what you remember from that experience. And that is why in the human experience, we can't bear truth. It starts at that age. Because truth is associated with being punished, with being shamed, and it starts at that age. Can you relate to what I'm saying? You remember that moment. And, it, and a, a sense of fear and truth right there at age seven. And this is an archetypal experience. So that telling the truth becomes a very frightening experience. You don't remember it? What about? I was trying to remember if I did that to him or not. Ask him. Mm -hmm. Ask your son to remember it. Because it, it, he went through it. This is archetypal. Trust me, it's there. It's the formative thing about truth. So, now then. What archetypal knowledge is about is seeing truth, is recognizing truth, because what you are going for is the clearest truth in you, in you. Now, there are, this is a, look at all this paper I get to write on. Okay, I'm gonna draw, this thing goes down and it's plaid. Who designed this room? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm going to draw three columns here. 
And the first thing about these columns is that um, this is uh, these are how I this is how I work with the chakra system. How many of you have never studied with me? Never been in a workshop with me? How lovely! Thank you. This is how I work with the chakras. I work with them in three columns. And each of these columns represents three levels of consciousness. So that your first, second, and third chakras, which are below your waist, from here down, this is the age of, of Aries, this is the world that is literal. So if I hit any of the chakras below your waist, like buttons, bing, 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 all three of those energy systems see the world literally. They have no imagination. They're pure survival chakras. That's all they're interested in. They're absolute survival forces. Very quickly, the first chakra is all tribal data, family, etc. I'm going to go through this at the speed of light. We could go slower later. This is all tribal data. If I was doing a medical reading on you, health reading, this is where I'd get all the stuff about your family, your, your uh, family history, um, bone structure, uh, Uh, family structure, um, just tribal stuff. Your, uh, this is good. This is where all your superstitions are. Now, here's something archetypal. I don't, uh, people have more faith in their superstitions than they do in God. That is universal. They have no faith in God like they do in trinkets. How many of you have trinkets? Talismans, trinkets, crystals, rocks that you have absolute faith in, your rocks. But when it comes to God and, and you, I don't know about God, but rocks, no problem. <laughs> Talk to me. So this is the rock crowd. <laughs> These are people who will never say the word demon, but they will say negativity. <laughs> Do you feel the negativity? Because they're much too sophisticated to say there's a demon in this room. But it's negativity. <laughs> okay, second, are you getting the impression of what I think about that? The second chakra is creativity, sexuality. This is power that is one on one. This is your money. So all your lower back pain is often financial stress. This is your center of greed. This is your center of cravings. So I'm going to ask you, and this is true for everybody. What do you crave that drains your power that is totally not rational? Not rational, controls you. Controls you. Your cravings. Huh? Well, food is one type of craving. I'll let you get off with that, but if you want me to really push you, it won't be fun. You want to be on the receiving end? Okay, I'm talking about a craving. People's approval. People's approval. Excellent. Thank you. Control. What? A, huh? Control, Control over things. You, things. No. Anything. Anything. You need to control it. Add a girl. <laughs> what else? Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. It's just us in the room. <laughs> huh? Think of us in a hot tub. Okay, what else? 
Recognition from whom? Not everybody. Who? Peers? All peers or one peer? No, no, I, this does not help listening to you. Okay, good. Oh, those the one you, okay, all right, recognition, okay, got it. Okay, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna point, yes, girl. To be loved by someone, a, a significant other. Okay, excellent, okay, I'm gonna, yes. Bye. Look, look, this is, here. Cherubs. <laughs> this probably won't be the first time I'm going to say this, but speaking in sentences is really fun. So, <laughs> okay. So, go ahead, do it again. From people I admire or the people you admire? Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to hit a pause button here. And we are talking about archetypal. This is for everybody. Everybody has cravings. I'm going through this, not because I find it fascinating, though I do, but because what you need to know is that you're built like everybody else. And that, too, is archetypal. And that every human being has cravings. And that your cravings will destroy you. And that, in, and that when somebody says, I wonder why I'm not healthy. Why did I get sick? I want the one reason why I got sick. Nothing is more absurd. There's no such thing as one reason why you got sick. You have to go through your madness your cravings. List your 30 cravings. I crave recognition. When I don't get it, you don't get it. What? What do you do when you don't get it? How many of you crave your own world of justice? How many of you crave vengeance? Put your hands up. I'm not letting you out of here till you put your hands up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. These are the things that uh, one, one of the many things I learned from my Teresa of Avila experience, which was for me the greatest gift from heaven, is that pride will destroy me. Pride will destroy you. The inability to admit you're like everybody else is the worst thing in the world. The need, we hold being ordinary in contempt. We think, God, make us anything, but don't make me ordinary. <laughs> oh, no. And when, and when parents say to me, it, my child is special, I want to gag. <laughs> oh, not you too. I'm glad you think your child is special, but trust me, they're not. And what you're doing, and this is archetypal, is a rain dance around your child so that ordinary things don't happen to them. And this is superstitious, and this is first chakra. And this is archetypal, and it's a psychic ritual. So get a grip on yourself. This is just an archetypal psychic ritual. And when if something does happen to your child, out of your mouth comes, I can't believe this happened. Because I've spent a whole lifetime saying they're special, and they turned out to be ordinary mortals. <laughs> to which I would say, put your head in the toilet for seven minutes. <laughs> and come to your senses. You are as ordinary as the day is long. And owning that you have cravings and getting over your pride, getting over the fact that you think, oh, I could never do that. 
I could never, yes you can. And yes you are. And only those who get over themselves heal. When somebody says, why aren't I healing? Start with pride. Start with, go to, then from pride, go to greed. Go to cravings. This is the new medicine. Okay? Now, the third. Your third is your, this is your ego. This is your sense of I. This is your narcissism. This is your sense of my need to be special. It's in your tummy. Now, here's the healthy side of that. Here's an archetype. Everybody needs to be witnessed. Now, that's a very different thing than being special. Everybody needs to be witnessed. Everyone needs to have a sense of knowing that someone knows you're alive, that you're here, that someone knows that your life matters. Everybody wants to know their life matters. Everybody wants to know that. Everybody wants to know that your life is, is something that walking the earth, that this earth is, a, this world's a better place because you're in it and you're in it. Everybody wants to know that. Now, that's what this world's about, is discovering that extraordinary feeling. This column is about having a job. This is a career. And this is a calling. Now these are three different, very different levels of consciousness. Very different. A job is about surviving and paying your bills. And when you have a job, you look at the world oftentimes like, I just got to get through this. And your day is almost, is usually a day of repeat performances. And then some part of you one day says, there's got to be more. Maybe you say it, maybe you don't, but you're built to say it. This is archetypal. You are built to wake up. You're built to find life intolerable. <laughs> you are built to find the ordinary unbearable in many cases. You're built to wake up and say, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. There are many here's you can't take and you are meant to not take them. And when that experience overtakes you, you are likely to say something's wrong only if you really understood it, you would say something's very right. It all depends on the, on the scale through which you understood something. If you weren't afraid of change, you would say something's very right and I'm getting my signal to take up my bed and walk. I've just gotten my walking papers. You would call your friends and say, the sky is cleared for my journey. I've got to go. If you understood at this level what was really happening to you, you would be ecstatic. But because you go to this level where you base everything on the world not moving, not moving. When it does move, it seems abnormal, like something's wrong. But if you understood it from this level, which is where truth is, which is where the nature of law is, which is where the nature of life is, which is the archetypal realm, you would recognize change. I'm programmed to change. It is the nature of life for me to move on. It is the nature of life for me 
to find circumstances where I cease to learn unbearable. I am no longer learning here. Any circumstance that begins to drain me of my life, I will be taken out of. Whether or not I want to go, I will be taken out of because it is the nature of life to protect my life. And if a circumstance begins to become toxic, I will be removed for the sake of my own survival. Are you following me? This is, come up here, this is the 10th chakra law. It is law, it is impersonal. It has nothing to do with you personally. It has to do with the survival of the creature you are. It is law. It is simply law. A creature is beginning to diminish in health because of the circumstance. My plant needs to be taken out of this window. It is not getting enough light. If this plant takes that personally, I'm going to smack it. <laughs> There's nothing personal about that. I take any plant out of the window that doesn't get enough light. This is what I do so my plants survive. There's nothing personal. Life will take you out of the window if you're not getting enough light. This is archetypal, learning to speak archetypes is the greatest survival tool you can have. Because you get to sit back and say, wait a minute here, I'm being moved and I've got to figure out why. I have to understand what are the transitionary forces occurring around me. What's occurring within me? What are my archetypes? Who am I? What really motivates me? And instead of looking at people on the outside, expecting them to change in your world, you're the one, the only person you need to deal with is you. Not that you don't care about them, but when you, you, in order to care and truly care deeply about anybody, you have to figure out you. You have to figure out how your fears work. You have to figure out how to love without being manipulative. How many of you punish people that you love? Now, why would you do that? Because you love them. Yeah. You know, why, why would you do that? How many of you turn love on and off? That's it. I'm not talking to you. Okay. That's the child. That's the pouty child. I would say to the pouty child, you've got two minutes to shape up. You have two minutes. You have two minutes, or you're out. Two minutes. Because I'm an adult. You're going to communicate, or you're out. And it's going to go down a lot better when we talk. That's it. Okay? This is where you got to learn and think, this is not working. This is not working, because this is not helping. Okay, now I'm going to hold that and I want to just talk about the grand, wonderful, incredible place we are in history right now. Because you think, why am I here now? Why is it important for me to learn this? What's going on in the world around us? What's cooking? Because we are living at the greatest moment in the history of human civilization. Isn't that a mouthful? Isn't that a mouthful? My avocation's history. I've read history consistently since I was nine years old. Why I don't teach history is beyond my comprehension, but that's not how it worked out. 
And I, history is my great navigating tool. And um, I think that it's awesome to understand where we are today from a historical perspective because every event playing out in the heavens is attached to you. Every event playing in the world is attached to you and you are attached to it. It is an illusion for you to think that anything in this world is separate from you. Now that sounds like one of those theoretical sort of things. But today, all change is universal and it's immediate. And here's a word that usually doesn't go with change. It is profound. A person on a computer can hack the New York Times, like they just did. Or they could hack bank accounts and wipe out the finances of entire corporations. You can wake up in the morning and find out that the a decision made in North Korea could affect your bank account. That's, that would be incomprehensible a few decades ago. The fact is, we don't know who, our, who is managing our lives anymore. So with that in mind, let's talk about a new mythology. So you understand the power of myth and then the power of your mythologies. We all have myths, and this is archetypal. This is how we find what's our archetypes. The United States has an archetype, one of its archetypes. I did a, a, a DVD, a CD, I can't tell the difference, <laughs> a CD, audio, on the archetypes of the United States. And of course, the US believes and, and you know, promotes the belief that it's the greatest country in the world. Mm. And that part of its greatness is that every one of its actions is noble and honorable. And it does no harm to anybody, anywhere. So it's, and that it's the richest country in the world. And because it has that myth, it loathes to look at the poor. The poor are arrested if they're on the street for too long. They don't look a certain way. They're kicked off the street. We can't bear to look at the poor, or the dirty, or the unclean. I think they're freeloaders. Extraordinary in this country. Now, we used to we used to do so much for poverty, and now we're so against the poor. It's an interesting thing in this country. Anyway, the great turning point for us, for the world, was when we entered the nuclear age. The second Oppenheimer split the atom. The very second. The incomprehensible happened. We speak about how the world changed the night Jesus was born, or when Buddha entered the world. But in the Christian mythology, it was the night the star was above. All of a sudden, the whole world changed when a light entered the world. That's a mythology. Then, and what, what what a mythology does is it tries to capture and talk about a power came in that had never been in before. In that same way, when Oppenheimer split the atom, I want you to think of it this way. Do you know the myth of Zeus and Prometheus? 
Prometheus went into, into the gods and he stole fire. And Zeus was so angry that Prometheus would steal the powerful element of fire and give it to mortals so that they could advance their civilization because he knew that the mortals would do something bad. But they weren't wise enough. So he thought, hmm, what am I going to do? So he called the goddesses together. And he, says, build, he said, build me a false goddess, not a real one. And this is important. Every element of a mythology is important. Every element of your mythologies are important. Because everything you believe, you believe for a reason. So they constructed this woman a false goddess. And he said, of all the, th I want her beautiful, but I want her curious. And he called her Pandora. And he said, now, go bring her to earth. He had Hermes. Go bring her to earth and bring her to Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus, as his bride. And then he gave her a box or an urn. And he said, don't you open this. And of course, when she does, knowing that she would, in the box were all the toils of humanity. When Oppenheimer split the atom, it was the new Zeus Pandora mythology. We we opened, we stole the fire one more time from Mount Olympus. And once again, ever since that moment, we have spent, the US became a type of Zeus, the first nuclear power, the first global power as big as Zeus. But ever since that time, we have been living in a world in which the fundamental question was, who has the fire? Which country has the fire? Who has the fire? And all of the generations born since the nuclear age, every one of them, including all of us, we are the only generations ever since the history of humanity that have grown up wondering whether we would survive. We are the only ones. We are it. Every other generation grew up with no doubt in their mind that there'd be another generation. That they would that survival was a given, that the plants would survive, that the water would survive, that the air would survive. They never thought about it. We are the only ones ever to have created a world where we wonder day by day by day if any of us will survive. There was 2012, there was Y2K. We are always projecting the next possible destruction date. Will we get over this? The Mayan calendar. We are always looking and projecting mythologies of destruction and that is archetypal. And that has had a tremendous impact, a tremendous impact on how we relate to each other, how we form relationships in the world, how we see the world, how we, how we form dynamics within ourselves, and what's going on within us. We live in a world where everything has become temporary, where we don't trust the ground we walk on and we don't even get it because nobody is talking about it. We look at all the world governments and they are, have gone mad. 
they have gone mad because one of the things that's true is that they're facing problems that they themselves do not know how to solve because problems have solutions. We don't have problems anymore. We have predicaments and predicaments do not have solutions. They simply are. Now, having said that, having said that, that is the situation, shall we say, at the ordinary mortal level. Up here, when someone says to me, you know, what is, what is God? Oprah asked me that when I was on her show. What, what's God? And I said, law. Law. I don't believe in religions. I think they're all costume parties. <coughs> I have no use for them, though I love studying them. And, but religion is a first column thing. They're rituals and they're this and they're that, and they're still fighting over them. Would I give religions an archetype? Yeah, costume party. <laughs> but seriously, yes, what I, this is what religion is. Religion if, is, are the politics of God. And they are the need for human beings to grab on to the power of God and say, God is ours. And God loves us better than God loves you. So we have the power and you don't, which is why they're all nonsense. Right. They're all unequivocal nonsense. But in this column where there is absolutely no anything, what you have is mystical law. That mystical law, if you look at the universe, every single thing is subject to law, even illness. If it wasn't for the fact that illness was subject to law, they, there would be no medicine. Everything is law, the planets, nature, even our behavior. Archetypes are law. They are consistent because they govern power. Power. Power is the fundamental ingredient of life and the human experience. At this level, power manifests in a physical way. We want to touch it. It's tactile. So we call power stuff. We call it money, we call it status, stuff. We wanna stuff it and touch it. So it's religion. It's what kind of power do you have? Do you have a lot of money power? Do you have a lot of this power? This is where you wanna physically touch the world of power. Here power is measured differently. It's internal. It's what you do with yourself. Do you have self-control? Do you have interior power? Are, do you have a way of perceiving? Are you congruent? Does your heart match with your head? Do you have a level of consciousness? Here we call power in this, in this world, in this world it's kind of a physical. Here people refer to, to this power as energy. They talk about energy consciousness. But that's for amateurs. In this world, it's grace. This is a very high altitude. Very high altitude. Very few people deal with grace. Because once you're at that altitude, you have to acknowledge the holiness of other people. And you can't decide, well, you're holy, but I don't like you. <laughs> okay? Energy has no sacredness to it. And it's also the reason why energy, just working with energy never heals anybody. People talk about doing energy healing. They don't heal. They may help someone feel better. It could be very tranquilizing. But it lacks the, the altitude to actually dissolve a cancer. It lacks the capacity to actually help blindness heal. It lacks the vibration to engage a miracle. 
It cannot and never will be able to do that. In order to do that, you have to work with the graces. On the 10th chakra, what you have is the altitude of law, and you're simply working with law. You're working with an understanding that in this realm, we have archetypal patterns, we have cause and effect, we have the law of vibration, we have the law of um, choice, action, and reaction. These laws are laws that were simply set up by a force greater than us. We are all subject to these laws. Every choice I set in motion has a consequence. It's as simple as that. And the reason you go into states of learning is so that you become someone wise enough to put wise choices, to make wise choices that create wiser consequences. And that you become someone who's capable of, of becoming a light that can eclipse what is dark. That you know your own light. That you tell yourself, no matter how old you get, no matter whether you're in your 80s or what, so long as you have life, you have purpose. That you do not live on this planet thinking that other people are responsible for the weight you should be carrying on this planet. No one else is. If you are on this planet, you don't look for recognition. You pull your weight and you make a difference, whether someone sees you and applauds or not. Because that is what your calling is. That is what your calling is. And the reason you look at your archetypal patterns, the reason you learn the language of your soul, is because you have a soul. Because that is what you were born to do. That is what you were born to do. And because that's how inherently powerful you are. Why would you want to live any other way? Why would you want to walk around being confused about who you are? One of the most intimidating things in the world is to have someone challenge your dignity, to have someone challenge your power, or for you to wake up in the morning being terrified to be fully who you are. No, that's not, that's not, that's not the way it is. Now, what questions do you have? I beg your pardon, honey, I can't hear you. What about Hillary? If that Hillary was confronted for having a goddess archetype? No. Did I hear the question wrong? I don't know. No. That you had said that she had a goddess archetype. Hillary? I was talking about Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Athena. Hillary has Athena. Absolutely, I think she's spectacular. <laughs> I love Hillary. Okay, what else do we have? Any other questions before I take you away? Nothing? Yes, sir. Yeah, what, what's your uh, question? I remember mine and I was dealing with cookies, so I was happy. Ah! <laughs> <coughs> you said the truth. Sorry. You said lying. Oh, here it is. The truth equals the shame and the punishment, but the lying equals what? Because I was thinking about it in my experience, and this is what you said. That what lying equals safety. Lying, lying becomes safety when you associate. If you, you know, when someone lies and they get away with it because they're afraid, they think, if I tell the truth, I'm going to be punished. If that's what they associate with telling the truth, that oftentimes becomes the, uh-oh, if I tell the truth, I'm going to be punished. If that's how the adult, yeah, lying feels safe. What happens is lying. 
Yeah? Yes. What about if you did the lie? What about, well then, what if you tell the truth and it was, and you were rewarded for that and said, that's perfect, thank you. That's perfect. That person would grow up comfortable with, with more comfortable with truth. That person would grow up more likely being an honest, congruent person. When I was a child, I, 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 well, if I may finish something, it, and we'll get right back to that. But here's the and here's the thing. Let me add something. Um, and that person would be very blessed to have parents that would handle that initiation in that way. Let me add that. Um, but we have a very dark Christian culture. We don't have an enlightened Christian culture. We have a very dark, suffering Christian culture. And in this Christian culture, um, the, it's emphasized the benefits of suffering and that suffering equals you deserve rewards for suffering. By God, you deserve it. Jesus, by God, he rose from the dead. The least you could do is get a financial reward um, for your suffering. I mean, look what we did with 9-11. They all got money. I mean, so we have a very serious issue around look at all I've suffered and I need rewards for my suffering. We believe in this twisted morality of having obscenities everywhere, but if we tell the truth, we live in a culture of lies and liars. We know we're being lied to by everybody, but if you tell the truth, you're arrested. You are, yeah, you, I mean, the McCain at the Senate hearing yesterday was lying blatantly about his own past with Iraq, but I, I, I can't even, but, so yeah, exactly. it's, we, we, we cannot bear truth in this country. We simply can't take it. We, we simply can't take it. It is just not easy. It doesn't go down well. It's not popular. And part of that is, it's hard to have truth when so much of it comes from a church society that is fundamentally crooked as a dog's hind leg, when the government's crooked. I mean, it's just where does the truth come from? The newspaper is crooked. I know where, where, where's the, where's the center, where's the source of truth? So, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to have integrity in, and we're not the only country that suffers from that. I mean, it's not like you want to see truth challenge, go to China, you know, go to Russia. We're not the only, we don't, human beings don't like truth. I don't want to know the truth. I don't want to know the truth. I mean, look at how many times you've had clear intuitive hits and you don't want to know it. Look at how many times you have had a hit and you don't want to know the truth. Not that fast. You don't want to know it. And so you go into some kind of cycle of denial. And then two years or one year later when the truth comes out, you say something like, well, I knew it all along. <laughs> but you don't want it that fast. And that's, that's why, you know, you, you go, I mean, if you, 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 your intuition is lightning fast. And one of the reasons why people are simply bad intuitives is because they don't like the speed of it. You can't just be intuitive at work and then turn it off. It is what it is what it is. Intuition is not about getting answers to make you safe so that nothing happens to you when you have romance and a lot of money. <laughs> oh, Christ, this country just gets on my nerves. Yeah.
Oh, no. What, what, when identifying an archetypal pattern in yourself, for example, um, uh, what is a pattern that is, if I said, what's something in you that would be, that you could never, ever, ever give up, no matter what, it would be a game changer for you in, a real, in, in life. If someone said, what can't you give up? Absolutely not. I know no, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking, what's your name? Barbara Jean. Barbara Jean. What, what would you say, sorry, this is, this is me, this is who I am, this is part of my life. I, like, if you asked me that, I would say I could give up teaching, absolutely, but I could never give up writing. My psychic Your psychic intuition, okay. That would be a game changer for you. So if you, you if someone said in life, you, we, we have this beautiful home for you in Hawaii. We would pay all the expenses. You never had to work again, but you can't be a psychic. I want what did you say? I would not want no, you could never work as a psychic intuition. You could, you'd have to shut that whole part of you down. And what would you say? Take house? No, and and all, for, all expenses, all expenses for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're not tempted. Okay, that would be, so you have the archetype, let's say, of the, so, um, okay, sort of a, an, an intuitive, let's just go with intuitive right now. Okay, I'm not quite sure. But what we do is you examine that archetype in its shadow myths and its light myths and how it talks to you and what mythologies it tells you what mythologies it has for example what power mythologies does that tell you about yourself and how do those negative ones get you in trouble because they do, very much. Because, and under that I would say, what privileges do you, did you tell yourself, do you, t don't answer fast because you're gonna shoot from the hip and I don't want you to do that. Don't even consider it because I just saw it in your eyes. Don't even go there with me because I'm faster than you. <laughs> but, what the shadow mythologies do is we make them up and we tell ourselves these shadow myths that we're entitled and we're different and we're better because we can't bear to be ordinary and this is your myth this is your archetype that makes you extraordinary and makes you and and therefore da 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 Okay, and that's what this one, so you have a whole myth in your head about how intuitive you are. And you may well be, but you also have a myth in your head about it. And you're far more intuitive than other people. And da 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 da, and I'd never give it up, and oh no, not me, this, I could just da 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 da. Right, okay, so that's part of your myth about who you are and why you need that myth is the next one. Why do I need that? What does it give me? This is how you examine an archetype. This is how you do it. Because a lot of these patterns get you in trouble. They get you in trouble. They get you in big trouble. Because when you're in a relationship, when you're in life, Someone may step on one of your myths. <laughs> when they're stepping on a myth about yourself, there's no truth there. There's no truth. The only truth that ever exists is up here. It has to be truth for everybody to be a truth. But your myths are stories you tell yourself. They're just stories that you tell yourself. 
And in classical mysticism, the journey of the mystic and what makes those journeys so sometimes excruciating is that that's what you go in search of. These myths you tell yourself for self-protection. And you start unwinding them and you get to a myth that says, I really think I'm special. Why? I need to be. Why? <laughs> Nobody ever told me I'm special growing up and? But I need to be. Why? <laughs> Go in your room and cry for 10 minutes and come back here. You're still crying. I'll give you 15 more, then shape up. And then when you release the demon, what goes with it is resentment over people that you perceive through that myth. And then they look pretty just like people, no different than you. And then what happens is you find that you're able to love with an open heart. And one of the worst things is to actually feel love trying to come out of you and to hold it back because of a stupid myth. Okay. Yeah, one more. I'm wondering if you could give you some advice about trying to stay um, in a field of grace and you um, I'm struggling with trying to stay in a field of grace and use grace in a situation with someone who's very close to me who is living in complete darkness and, and is really, really suffering. Because of that. Well, it depends. Is this a child, a, a, a your sister? Um, well, first of all, family members are, are a different can of worms from friends, from this, because family members are the, are the most difficult and challenging, a family member to a family member, because inherently you're bonded by blood. So they know you're not going anywhere. <laughs> well, you know, and even if you go where for six months, oops, there you are again. Okay. Okay. Uh, number two, and this is where, uh, honest to God, it takes a great deal to separate and to spot the archetypal thing, dynamic going on in her. What are the archetypal patterns she's coping with? Is it the addict? Is it, what are the archetypal patterns that she is dealing with? I, I don't know what they are. Do you know what they are? I know what some of them are. I know what some of them are. The huge saboteur. Okay. 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 So she's heavily involved. Those patterns have a natural route to them. They have a natural route. You know, and it's, it, this is exactly like this. If, if someone takes a certain medication that they shouldn't have taken, and they've already ingested it, and you say to me, tell me what to do to help them, I would have to say, this has to run its course. You can sit there with them, but that's the nature of this medication. It has to run its course. That's the same thing with the addict. It has to run its course. And that's the nature. This is why it's so brilliant to understand the archetype. It has to run its course. You can't get through. And one of the things that's true about the addict archetype is that the outsider can't get in. It has nothing to do with you here again. You have to hear me out. This isn't about love. It's not about family. It is not about her rejecting you. The outsider, this is for everybody. If I was giving a lecture on the addict, the outsider cannot get in. This is just true. This is the way it is. The addict has to bottom out and come to the realization, I am an addict and I need help. That's the way it is. And until your sister 
comes to that conclusion herself and says, I need help. Come here. Help me. There's nothing you can do. And what you can do is write on a, a little piece of paper, I am here whenever the day comes. Stick it in her wallet and say, and this is, the, I am always saying this prayer for you. This is the prayer I am always saying for you. God watch and keep you. I will always say this prayer. And when you're ready, come home. Okay. Okay, everybody. I am going to send you home. Teresa always prayed this way, and I loved it. She would say, close your eyes. I want you to just picture yourself under a starlit night. Picture yourself in the room, and it's all silent. And you're in your inner castle, and you can see the stars. Teresa would always say, let nothing disturb the silence of my time with you, Lord. Let the angels hover over me. Watch me through the night. Protect me from all darkness. Stand quietly at my bedside. Watch over me as I dream. Cleanse the darkness from my soul. Guide me through the night. Wake me up with grace. Amen. Thank you. Okay, everyone.